Let's come together in prayer. God of love and hope, be with us as we meet tonight, under such strange and difficult times. We come trusting in your mercy and love, longing to know and to learn more about your ways. We come to be guided in the ways of your truth, to experience the joy of your salvation. We come tonight aware of your steadfast love, helping us to overcome the trials and temptations which can descend on us at any time. Lead us, O God, to do what is right in your eyes and teach us to follow the humble way of Christ, your beloved Son, our crucified and risen Lord. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent your Son to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. May the love of Christ so fill us that we may become a channel of your love streaming out to others in all we see and do. Thank you for your word of truth. And may we grow more like Jesus day by day. Amen. This reading comes from Acts 9, verses 10 to 16. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord. He answered, the Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's come here with great authority from your chief priest to arrest anyone who calls on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. This reading is taken from 1 John chapter 3, reading from verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us.
This is what I want my church to be. This is what I want the world to see. Who it is you follow. Love each other, one another. Love each other in the way that I have loved you. Walk together and whatever comes. Love each other in the way that I have loved you. Let the room be hushed and still. Let us go to where. This is what I'm asking you to do. This is why I'm kneeling here beside you. This is what I want my church to be. This is what I want the world to see. Who it is you Tonight's theme in our Holy Week service is It is Finished, Enemies Reconciled, which recalls Jesus' last cry on the cross as we read in John's Gospel, knowing that all was now completed and so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is that same risen Jesus who has reconciled you and me with God through the cross, who stops Paul a.k.a. Saul in his tracks on the Damascus Road. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul makes his first appearance at the stoning and martyrdom of Stephen, and we read, Saul was there, approving of his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. When Jesus met Saul, he was on his way to Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, i.e. Christians, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. Saul meant business. He is described as breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. 
These Christians, as far as he was concerned, were God-forsaken heretics. They were enemies of God. And Saul's mission, as he saw it at this point, was to restore God's rightful place at the heart of the nation. So when he arrived at your door, he wasn't coming round with the better wear catalogue or asking you if you'd ever thought of changing your energy supplier. Spare a thought then for Ananias, a disciple living in Damascus, when Jesus calls on him in a vision and says, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, this is not a vague, schmaltzy thought for, uh, for the day type of affair. This is a very specific in instruction from Jesus to go to meet Saul, who had been zealously attempting to destroy the church. Self-isolating would have appeared a very attractive option, and Ananias is in mind to put in his apologies for this particular meeting, reminding Jesus of all the harem Saul has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. His reticence is understandable, but Saul's meeting with Jesus has left Saul for the moment totally helpless and blind, needing to be led by his companions to Damascus. Barclay notes, Saul went into Damascus a changed man. And how changed? The one who had intended to enter Damascus like an avenging fury was led by the hand, blind and helpless. Jesus, however, wasn't going to leave Saul like that for long. When we truly meet Jesus, we may well be broken. But Jesus doesn't leave us battered and broken by the roadside. Similarly, Jesus had much bigger plans for Saul than that. Jesus tells Ananias that his apologies are not accepted, and it is his job to go. Go. This, is my, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Clearly, Jesus' plans for Saul would fall foul of your average risk assessment, and much of his future mission would not fall into the vicar's tea party category. Ananias obeys Jesus' command. He goes to meet Saul and says, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. A few days after this, Saul began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, much to the amazement of everyone who had heard about the old Saul. Tom Wright points out, we never hear of Ananias again. We don't know how he became a follower of Jesus. We know nothing about him except this passage. And it's enough that he was a believer, 
that he knew how to listen to the voice of Jesus, that he was prepared to obey it, even though it seemed ridiculously dangerous, that he went where he was sent and did what he was told. And he did it with love and grace and wisdom. You can't ask for more. Brother Saul, brother, part of the family, bound already by ties of a new sort of kinship, the kinship indicated on the road when Jesus told Saul that he was persecuting not just his followers, but him. And if Saul could see that, he could see anything and everything. I once heard it said, you sin, you go. The other person sins, you go. In other words, don't stand on ceremony. Don't wait for the other person to make the first move. You can't arrange an in-person meeting during this current lockdown, but this won't last forever. In the meantime, you can lift the phone, text, email, even send a letter. Will you? It's been said that the current COVID-19 crisis has brought out the worst and the best in people. We've all been forced to rethink how we live our daily lives. We've had to take stock. We've been stopped in our tracks. We've had to prioritize. Where has Jesus figured in your priorities? Jesus wants his best for you and me and everyone else. Just as Jesus put an end to you and me being separated from God by our sin at Calvary, that's history, that's in the past, that's finished. Jesus promised us, it is finished. Similarly, each of us should be reaching out in his name to those folks who haven't yet heard that promise. Does this current crisis present new opportunities for you to engage with others and introduce them to Jesus? I'd be very surprised if you conclude that it doesn't. Maybe you need to be listening that bit more closely. Both Saul and Ananias were described as praying prior to Jesus setting up their life-changing meeting particularly for Saul. What a joy when you can welcome someone someday as a brother or sister in Christ. It is finished. So what are you going to do about it? Amen. I want to share a prayer by John Harvey of the Iona community entitled The Way of the Cross. Jesus, as we start once again to follow you on the way of the cross, we are apprehensive, for we are not sure of ourselves. On our journey, we have often been afraid, often sought the safe options often fudged the sharp solution. On our journey, we have often tried to hide our real selves from others, from ourselves, and from you. We who dare to say we are following you know how faltering are our footsteps, how delicate our discipleships, how feeble our faith. Yet still you call us by name and invite us into your company and onto your road. So give us the courage and the commitment we need 
Help us to look out for one another on the road. Show us how we may share the duty and the joy of discipleship, knowing that in the end, it is you who have blazed the trail, you who accompany us all the way, you who will meet us on the road and say our name. Amen. Reconciling love is patient and persevering, but its ministry is a never-ending daily routine. It's riddled with complications and complexities, and it takes an enduring hope to tutor in a drug rehabilitation centre and to visit people in prison, or to pray for people who we do not like and cannot get on with. Reconciliation is a responsibility that we cannot delegate. Each of us is part of a pattern of relationships that demand respect. Our spirit will be tested at critical moments, but all of life belongs to God, and all brokenness awaits healing. Damaged personal relationships of all manner and making, and our own failed covenants with ourselves and with God, all can be fixed through love, the same love God showed for us. Let's pray. We read in 1 John 3, verse 11, that one of the marks of a Christian is that we should love one another. John is blunt on this point, but so was Jesus, who showed the highest form of love and reconciliation when he gave his life for us. It was necessary to bring us back to God and to provide each of us with a fresh start, a start that was only possible through the death of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Father, help us in our lives to have the right attitude to everyone. Help us to have the right attitude to ourselves. Keep us from the pride which makes us too pleased with ourselves. The false modesty which is an excuse for avoiding responsibility. The blindness which can see our own faults and the selfishness which puts self in the centre of everything. Keep us from the critical spirit which looks for faults, the thoughtless spirit that never thinks of the feelings of others and the fear of what others will say. Help us to have the right attitude to you. Keep us from the forgetfulness which never thinks of you, the rebelliousness that takes its own way of thinking and the irrelevance which forgets that you are here. Help us to think of ourselves, to think of others and to think of you as we should. At this time we bring before you those who, for whom life is very difficult and those who have difficult decisions to make about the future of the country and who honestly do not know what is the right thing to do guard and guide them to make the right decisions. We bring before you those who know that they can be their own worst enemies. Help them to stop this destructive behaviour and to seek ways of working in harmony with themselves and others. We bring before you those who have difficult people to work with, those who have to suffer unjust treatment, unfair criticism or unappreciated work. It is difficult to be motivated in such circumstances but Christ shows us a way of forgiveness. We have all experienced situations where friends have become enemies. Help us to make the initial contact with that person we have fallen out with or were not spoken to for some time because they have not contacted us. Make us bold enough to seek our, a re, out a reconciliation with them. Help us to show Christ's love and through reaching out we can make that, rub, that love grow which will then overcome the situation we have found ourselves in with other people. Help us to wipe the slate clean and to start again, just as you did for us through the sacrifice of your Son on the cross. We thank you for that reconciling love and ask that we can show the same love in our lives, all to the glory of your name. Amen.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.